All right. Um, I am going to record Politics in the Gilded Age so that way you can be prepared for the test that will be coming up on Tuesday. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is how Politics in the Gilded Age um, really were ineffective during the Gilded Age. Um, this is one of the reasons why you see the populace coming up. This is one of the reasons uh, why middle class reformers try to make changes. Um, I don't know whether that's because of the corruption, but that is certainly one of the, the ideas behind um, the, the problems in the Gilded Age, is that politics was so corrupt um, that this was why. Um, the Republicans uh, are the m main party that's in power. Matter of fact, they pretty much control the presidency uh, with the exception of uh, two diff separate terms. And actually, those two separate terms are held by the same guy. Um, that's Grover Cleveland. Um, and so they are the primary party that's in power. Um, they often control uh, the Senate. Um, but the party is split between kind of old guard uh, people that want to continue thinking about the Civil War, um, are concerned about black issues and, you know, kind of violations of black civil rights. And then you've got Republicans that are, um, that want to move on. They want to focus on business. They're tired of dealing with Reconstruction. Um, and for them, they start using this concept of what we call patronage. And patronage is the idea that I make sure that my best friends get a job in uh, in government. And so I take care of the people. So if you're in a, in a political machine and you're a party boss, you get your job because of patronage, because somebody's looking out for you. Um, and so the new Republicans want to get rid of patronage. Uh, they feel like it's making the Republican Party look bad. Uh, and that was definitely true when uh, Grant was president. Um, and so you have reformers wanting to move past the Civil War to focus on industrialization uh, and enabling industrial growth and focusing on urban problems and tariff problems. So they're actually very much pro-government involvement. Um, We've talked already, uh, we did the first week of school about the Compromise of 1877. I'm just going to kind of touch on this a little bit more. Um, know that 1876, southern states have questionable election results, lots of violence, and basically you have an agreement um, that assures that the Republican, Rutherford B. Hayes, is going to get enough electoral votes if he agrees to end Reconstruction. Um, Hayes is considered a reformer. He does not like patronage. Um, he talks a lot about kind of trying to clean up government. Um, all of this is a result of all the corruption that was happening um, before Hayes, like during the Reconstruction period under Ulysses S. Grant. Um, so the Republicans, so you have 1876, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, a Republican wins. Uh, the Republicans will win again in 1880 um, with James Garfield. James Garfield is also a reformer Republican. Um, he doesn't like patronage. Um, and he gets assassinated by somebody who's a disgruntled supporter, basically, feels like he should have gotten a job in the government um, because he supported Garfield. Um, and what this does is because that one of the issues why Garfield was assassinated is because of the fact of patronage, you see that the public really gets up in arms about this. And so people start saying, oh, we need to have reform. We need to get rid of this from our system. And so the, the man that, that was vice president, President Chester Arthur, um, he kind of, he and Congress signed what they call the Pendleton Act. This is civil service reform. Civil service is a job that you hold when you work with the government. Um, and so these are government jobs. Um, civil service um, is typically jobs like in, in administration, um, working for the State Department or the, the, the War Department or something like that. Um, and so the idea is that the Pendleton Act will start to make those jobs where they can only be awarded on merit. So if I win an election, I can't just bring a bunch of friends with me and get them on these nice, cushy government jobs. Now people have to, certain jobs have to be filled by those who pass a test. 
um, and it doesn't it doesn't matter what political party you belong to. You don't have to make political campaigns, uh, political campaign donations um, to specific candidates. That once you have this job, this job is yours, um, and you can't be removed for political reasons. Um, so you need to know the Pendleton Act. You need to understand that it's civil service reform that it ends the system of patronage and it guarantees that you kind of have this fair playing field <coughs> excuse me for um, people that are going to work for the government um, so it's meant to clean up corruption a little bit um, it doesn't work very well because it only applies to some jobs and it doesn't address any of the city politics um, that we talked about the other day that it is a direct reaction to um, to the urban problems in the cities uh, Republicans are known as the party of morality. Uh, they're strong in the Northeast, the Midwest, and the Great Plains. Um, they are very big business. Uh, they're made up of a lot of uh, former Union veterans from the Civil War. Uh, they support this idea of temperance, and I mentioned this the, uh, today with the reform movement, that temperance, the idea that we can solve urban problems if some of those people would just stop drinking. Uh, the Republicans liked the temperance movement, uh, and they supported it. They're often largely Protestant. The Democrats, on the other hand, are known as the party of personal liberty. Uh, they have a big stronghold in the southern states. Uh, they do have some support in the big cities um, because the, the Republicans are so kind of Protestant and anti-drinking um, that Catholics and immigrants who like to enjoy some alcohol um, prefer this Democratic Party that's not going to try to limit how much alcohol they drink. Uh, the Democrats were typically a little more sensitive to working issues um, as far as working conditions and wages, um, and so this is another thing that gets them some support. So the Republicans win the presidency more often, um, but they often win by a very narrow margin, and they have to deal with a Democrat-controlled House, uh, House of Representatives and a Republican-controlled Senate. Now, if you're not familiar with our political system, that may not make any sense to you. Just know that, you've, that we've got a president and the presidential branch. Our legislative branch has the House of Representatives and the Senate. And then you have the judicial branch that's the Supreme Court. So our legislative branch has two houses, so to speak. And because you have one party in charge of one house and one party in charge of the other, our Congress is very indecisive. They can't make up their mind what they want to do. And, um, and so there's lots of confusion. Um, you're also going to see that you have party bosses, and I mentioned these when we talked about urban politics. These are the guys, and I, and I explained that you had the neighborhood boss, but the neighborhood boss reported to a city boss, and the city boss reported to a state boss, and the state boss reported to a national boss. And so you had kind of this hierarchy. Well, it's these party bosses and that system, that hierarchy of people that control the political parties um, that are actually you know, choosing who's going to fulfill what jobs and that kind of thing. The president is really just kind of literally a tool in the hands of these party bosses. Um, Democrats will take over briefly in 1884. Um, really, there's not much difference uh, in Grover Cleveland and uh, the Democrats. Um, they start talking, our Democrats and the Republicans, they talk a lot about ending, ending corruption. We're going to address Tammany Hall and Boss Tweed, and we're going to take him down. And so some of the Republican reformers, um, that are a little bit frustrated by the Republican Party, that feel that the Democrats are more sensitive to the financial issues, the working issues. Remember by the 1880s uh, with Jacob Rees and the realism and the middle class is starting to be aware that there's actual economic problems for factory workers, that there's economic problems for farmers. And this is where you kind of see the effect of populism. The populists begin to make some noise and the Grange and that kind of thing. And so you start to get more people voting Democrat because the emphasis then comes on reform. <clears throat> Understand that at this point in 1884, there is very little difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. They are basically the same party with the exception of perhaps their attitude on temperance. Um, and, of course, if you remember, you know, the Haymarket riot happens in 1886. Um, and so you could have continued problems with, with labor unions and that kind of thing. And this will make people get very frustrated with Grover Cleveland. Um, so then we're going to have more economic problems, unions going on strike. 
um, and to protect the workers from industrialization. And you have business owners calling up the police and the government saying, oh, they're destroying my property. And so you have the police showing up. And this creates some tension. Um, and this will lose the Democrats some votes as well. Um, so you have lots of resentment uh, in the 1880s building towards these large corporations. The understanding of how you know the economies of scale and operating costs and profit margins. Um, think about George Pullman, for instance. Um, how these owners are taking advantage of the workers. There's frustration about this. Um, they're frust frustrated about big businesses being able to command better transportation rates. We talked about that with the farmers um, when we did our farming simulation that they had to pay a certain amount of money to move their crops and people felt that it wasn't fair for big commercial farms to get better rates. It wasn't fair for John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil to get special rates when they were this huge massive company. Um, so people want to start protecting small business and farmers. The feeling was that railroad companies were gouging customers and that trusts were unfair and that if trusts were really all that great, they could handle competition. And that the very essence of our society is competition. This was one of the problems with social Darwinism. Social Darwinism said that, well, you know, the survival of the fittest, the strongest person survives, right? The strongest company survives. Except some of those same strong companies were companies that relied on trusts to eliminate all their competition. And so is that truly social Darwinism? Um, and so this is one of the things that begins to build. Um, the result of this is going to be the Interstate Commerce Commission. You don't have to worry so much about the court case, although if you can remember Wabash v. Illinois, um, it does show up every now and then on the star test. Um, the big thing, if, if they show that on the star test, um, they'll give you some other clues that they're talking about the Interstate Commerce Commission. So the key thing is to know that by 1887, um, what we'll find out is that Grover Cleveland signs a bill to create the Interstate Commerce Commission. Um, this is meant to regulate railroad rates um, and to eliminate rebates and the kind of the variations that were happening uh, that these big companies were able to negotiate. Um, so there is an early attempt to try to fix this for farmers and small businessmen. Now, the problem with the Interstate Commerce Commission is it's not very effective. Um, they create this commission, but they don't really give it any power um, to do anything. Um, so it can basically, you know, shake its finger and say, no, 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 you shouldn't be doing this. But it can't punish any company or any railroad company for violating these rules. Um, so it's not as effective. It won't be effective really until Teddy Roosevelt becomes president in the early 1900s. And then we'll start to see that he um, begins to empower the Interstate Commerce Commission to be more effective at um, kind of breaking up kind of the domination of the transportation industry. So it takes a few years to figure out exactly how to use this thing. But it's very important to realize that people in America wanted to see improvements um, and they wanted to start to guarantee fair competition. Tariffs, which are a tax on imported goods, uh, tariffs are meant to protect manufacturing uh, and help manufacturing businesses. And the idea was that American manufacturers needed all the help they could get. And, but remember what I told you with the farmers, that tariffs also lead to high agricultural prices. So, uh, no, I'm sorry, not high agricultural prices, low agricultural prices. So when we have high tariffs protecting manufacturing, we shut off markets for our agricultural products, and this creates problems, right? So um, what you see is that the Democrats begin to argue, well, if we really want laissez-faire uh, laissez economy, we should lift the tariffs, that tariffs interfere with laissez-faire. Um, and what you see is that the Republicans and the Democrats never agree on this issue, and so tariff reduction just does, simply doesn't happen. Um, what we'll find out later is that the progressive presidents will then begin to develop the idea of an income tax to replace the tariff um, because they, th this issue is so divisive. Uh, Republicans get control in 1888. Um, and it's not so important to know exactly who's president as to know that he barely wins. Um, you do see them try to ad address the tariff issue. Um, 
it, you know, I, I don't know that it hurts necessarily. It does lead to um, some budget issues because they raise the tariff on some things and they lower the taxes on tobacco and sugar. Um, and it's meant to be kind of this mixed response. What it end, ends up doing is hurting how much revenue the government has, and so it creates a budget deficit, which when you look at, say, um, 1893 and kind of the railroad strike and, and all that kind of the Pullman strike. Um, this is part of the backstory to that is that they tried to, to, to cut some of these tariffs and it didn't work. Um, and so the public continues to blame industrialization um, for urban problems. So by the time you get to 1888, 1890, most people, especially middle class people, look at industrialization and they say industrialization is not very nice to workers and it's not very nice to people and we need to fix it. Um, so in 1890, they decide that, you know, okay, we need to do something to break the power of these large companies, that these large companies are adding more problems because workers don't have any options, customers don't have any options. And so the Republicans will basically basically be pushed into passing what we call the Sherman Antitrust Act. You need to know what this is. The Sherman Antitrust Act declares illegal any combination in the form of a trust or a conspiracy that restrains trade and commerce among the states, which is a bunch of legal jargon to say that if you don't if you if you run your company so or your organization so that no one can compete with you, they're going to come after you with the antitrust legislation. Um, so it's a great idea in theory. But remember, the Republicans, while they pass this legislation because this is what the public, the middle class, wants, and they don't, and they want to keep being elected. The Republicans are never, uh, they don't create any kind of enforcement agency, and so they don't really do anything to provide kind of the muscle to enforce this act. So again, it's not until Teddy Roosevelt becomes president that we see this act used in any way at, at whatsoever, uh, where you actually see an enforcement of this particular law. Um, most of the time, this law is used against unions uh, to break up strikes, and so this is kind of unfortunate. At the end of the day, all of this leads to a lot of frustration. There's a lot of weak action or inaction. The weak action would be the Sherman Antitrust Act, the Interstate Commerce Commission. Um, there's the stalemate in Congress um, between the Democrats and the Republicans. And you have these very tight elections. And so many people feel very frustrated with the two-party system. Um, and this is particularly true among farmers who had, who had so many other problems with debt and with the environment and that kind of thing. And so farmers feel very much at the mercy. Um, and once you have the gold and silver issue resolved, the Klondike gold strike, um, you will see that this will ease it up some. Um, but we do also kind of have this, uh, the, the emergence of populism and the uh, influence of that on the elections in the late 1800s. And we talked today about the impact of populism on segregation um, and how segregation and taking you know, arranging it so blacks had hard, a harder time to vote is a direct result of populism. So you can see that the frustration with the government leads to this third party. This third party leads to segregation. Uh, no, well, not segregation, but voting restrictions for blacks. Um, and so it's, there's just kind of a lot of connections going on here. So you need to be sure that you've kind of followed along um, with this PowerPoint and that you've listened um, and you've taken a few notes. Um, simply because I'm going to put a short quiz um, of about five questions or so in Edmodo, um, and it, this is purely extra credit. Um, you can take this quiz, and for every question you get right, I will give you a point on your Unit 1 test. Um, and no penalty if you get it wrong, so you can't lose anything by getting it wrong, and you have the opportunity to earn some extra points. So I'm leaving that up to you. Um, please listen to this uh, and pay attention. Uh, use the lecture to make sure you picked up the key points, and uh, don't forget to do your essay. Consider when you do your essay to think about such things like, um, like the fact that you have... Uh, have a weak government, right, as kind of a negative thing. Um, so you certainly could look at that as one of those negative examples. Um, if you have any questions with your essay or getting ready for the test, just let me know. Don't forget, there's a Socrative uh, with the test questions. It's class 844440. Um, so you can do that to practice for the test. I also have another video that goes over the assignments. Um, 
Anyways, thank you, and I will see some of you tomorrow, and the rest of you I may not see until Tuesday for the test. Um, if you are in 2B, we will take the Kahoot at the beginning of class as kind of a review, and then you'll take the test. But do not rely only on the Kahoot. You need to practice the Socrative as well. Thank you, and have a good evening.